thank you all for coming and welcome. Uh, my name is Nigel Inkster. I'm the director for future conflict and cyber security here at IISS, and it's my pleasure to be chairing this session on military uh, innovation uh, and adaptation. Um, it's nice to see so many people, including one or two old friends. John, I will never forget that gazelle trip back from Hereford to London in a thunderstorm with a massive hangover from the previous uh, night in the mess. Uh, but uh, um, the, the issue of military um, adaptation is something that, that has long uh, preoccupied uh, this uh, institute. And one of our founding fathers, uh, Sir Professor Sir Michael Howard, himself a, a decorated World War II veteran, uh, has, has, has observed that, uh, um, that uh, when it comes to uh, military preparation, War, you know, we need to remember that uh, conflict and warfare is a complex adaptive process and it's the capacity to adapt uh, more quickly than the other guy that uh, all things being equal is going to, to make, uh, make the difference. Um, in recent years, um, the UK uh, military has uh, confronted um, a number of conflict scenarios uh, which uh, called for various forms of adaptation. Um, I think uh, you know, the general consensus is that uh, um, in, in some respects adaptation uh, was, was pretty good, in others uh, perhaps uh, not so much. Uh, but my colleague, uh, retired Brigadier uh, Ben Barry, um, who's done a lot of thinking and, and writing about this, um, including uh, his <coughs> most recent uh, Adelphi, looking at the experiences of uh, British uh, armed forces in Iraq and uh, and in Afghanistan, is, is going to talk about the, 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 the this this topic. Um, ben is going to um, talk for around forty minutes. I will then um, open the floor for um, question, answer, and and discussion. Uh, we do, in principle, have until 2 o'clock, but uh, if we don't need that long, then uh, I'm not going to make you sit here in silence until the clock runs down. So without further ado, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to Ben. Thanks, Nigel. The ability of armed forces to innovate in peace and adapt in war is central to their failure or success. Military innovation has become a topic of considerable interest, not least as, as a result of the US third offset strategy, and to use its own words, it sees, that, sees, that seeks to invest aggressively in high-end innovative technologies to enhance our capabilities and to pursue innovative practices and organisational structures to meet the needs of the US forces faster, more efficiently and more effectively. <coughs> and the UK's Defence Innovation Initiative seeks to achieve similar results and resources and leadership are being applied to both. But the US and UK record of innovation and adaptation in the military is as much a record of failure as it is of success, demonstrating that both activities have often been very difficult. And Iraq and Afghanistan saw the US, the UK and many of their allies struggle to adapt quickly enough to the unforeseen character of post-conflict stabilisation. Adaptations were made, but at a cost in time, money avoidable casualties and political and military credibility. But this is an area where evidence-based analysis is thin. This is surprising as military history is full of examples of armed forces innovating and adapting both successfully and unsuccessfully. And indeed, a trip to surviving real-world physical bookshops in London, New York or Washington DC will show equally large sections devoted to business studies and to military subjects. Now, in the business studies section, there'll be many books and memoirs that seek to explain how businesses and their management can become more innovative, flexible, and agile in order to beat their competitors. But the military section, despite having some fantastic positive and negative examples in military history, will have very few titles that discuss the same aspects of military art as the business section does of, of business. Now, the topic is central um, to military operations, but you won't find much about it in the classic military uh, texts. 
For example, Sun Tzu and Clausewitz hardly mention the subject. General Sir Rupert Smith's influential book, The Utility of Force, excellent as it is, rightly identifies that in post-Cold War operations, new uses are found for old weapons and organisations. But that's all he says about it. So the problems of innovation and peace and adaptation in war are a persistent problem of militaries, but they're rarely examined. And although business consultancies, of which I'm pleased to see a few representatives here, have mined a rich seam of helping defence rationalise their finances, their procurement, their administration and their logistics, which I've seen for myself, relatively little of their work appears to have directly improved frontline capability. Now, I've been looking at this from a variety of perspectives, and I'd like to share my emerging thoughts uh, with you. I've tested them against the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, against 20th century military history, and more recently I've also tested them against innovation and adaptation in some non-military sectors, including the arts, fashion, and the healthcare sector. I'll start with some original thought, explaining the distinctions between innovation, adaptation, and learning lessons from operations, I want to illustrate with examples of successes and failures. I then want to develop some examples about how this can be better done and conclude with some emerging findings and suggest some further work. Um, let's start with my taxonomy. And of course there is no universally agreed taxonomy on this and some of the military writing, in my view, uh, tends to overcomplicate it. But I see three mutually supporting activities an existing analysis often sees these as separate activities. My view is they must be seen as a seamless whole. It's a, it's a stool with three legs. Now, my sound bites there are deliberately simplistic, but I hope that offers food for thought. So to start with innovation, that's best seen as change in peace, anticipating future conflicts. Now, armed forces that choose to innovate, and many choose not to, usually have plenty of time to think through the problems of future war, although the lack of the urgent pressure of war and the peacetime environment often means that resources are often scarce. But excellent examples of this are the way between 1918 and 1941, the US Navy developed their aircraft carrier capability and the US Marine Corps developed amphibious capability in anticipation of their roles in a Pacific war. Now, adaptation is best seen as change during conflict to increase military effectiveness. Now, war, of course, is a contest. It's a complex, interactive duel between two opponents, and sometimes even with three or more parties to the conflict. And that presents the opportunity for the, the parties to the conflict to adapt to their enemy's strategy, operations and <coughs> tactics. But because war is interactive, both sides have the potential to adapt at the conflict themselves from every level. So the problems posed don't remain constant. In fact, they can change with startling ra rapidity. So the parties to the conflict are engaged in a competition to out-adapt each other. Now, it's not that military leaders and commanders are less competent than business leaders, but unlike businesses which are continually engaged in conflict with their competitors... Many military organisations go to war only occasionally. And when they do go to war, commanders can struggle to identify sufficiently quickly whether or not their plans are succeeding, and if not, why not. And a very good example of this is the British, the Germans and the French on the Western Front in the First World War. They all struggled to adapt to the unanticipated conditions of trench warfare and to their opponents who were also struggling to adapt. And it took them all several years to come up with a, with, with a winning technique to break the deadlock. And this demonstrates that deriving and applying lessons on the fly isn't easy, particularly when the enemy is changing under the pressure of combat as well. And in the First World War, particularly in those early years on the Western Front, we saw many generals fail to adequately understand the new tactical conditions and also the technological <coughs> opportunities the generals had to be tactically competent, but they also had to balance that competence with the ability and openness to recognise when it ceased to be effective, effective. And 20th century abounds with examples of this, and three British examples. The Royal Navy. End of the First World War, it was the world leader in aircraft carriers. It had more aircraft carriers and carrier aircraft than everybody else combined. But it subsequently forfeited its lead 
to the highly innovative US and Japanese carrier forces. After the First World War, the British Army sought to develop an innovative combined arms armoured brigade called the Experimental Mechanised Force. And this was extensively trialled on exercise. But a change of army chief from a progressive to a reactionary led to the work ending, and this wasn't helped by defence cuts either. And the trials were successful, but they were probably more benefit to the German army, who studied them closely, than they were to the British in the 1930s. And in the 1930s, you have what I think is an excellent but <coughs> under-analysed example, the Royal Air Force. Fighter Command, under the leadership of Air Marshal Dowding, created the first modern radar-enabled networked air defence system. Indeed, it was probably the first networked enabled capability, full stop. And this innovation was the foundation of the British victory in the uh, Battle of Britain. But during the same period, Royal Air Force Bomber Command, who were actually the main effort of the Royal Air Force, conspicuously failed to anticipate the challenges it would face against enemy air defences in daylight and to innovate or experiment. And this was even while Fighter Command was flying out in the North Sea out to the North Sea, to then fly in to act as the enemy... Sorry, Bomber Command was flying its bombers out to the North Sea to fly in to act as the enemy to Fighter Command, who were using the exercises to refine their air defence network. And when Fighter Command... Sorry, when Bomber Command came up against German air defences in 1939, it was conspicuously overmatched. It then had to was forced to attack only by night, but it took several years of denial before Bomber Command was forced to recognise by no less than Churchill that it was largely failing to hit its targets. It then adapted with <coughs> commendable speed, speed and alacrity. But that example of the Royal Air Force in the 1930s is an uncomfortable example of the principal operating divisions of a single organisation having vastly different approaches to innovation and adaptation. I wonder if this is a more common example than we might think. And of course, if leaders identify the need to change, the financial, organisational, political, cultural and personal costs of adapting can be considerable. A particular difficulty seems to be critically re-examining pre-war assumptions, and these factors certainly seem to have applied to the US and UK in Afghanistan and Iraq. Of course, in contrast to innovation, armed forces attempting to adapt in war are not necessarily as constrained for resources, but they're often desperately short of time. And the third activity that unifies the other two is identifying and implementing lessons. And of course, there are decisions to be made, which lessons are relevant, which are so specific that something must be done, or which might have enduring value in the long term, or which are the lower priority ones. A positive example of this was the British Army after the Boer War. Now, this is, the Boer War administered many uncomfortable lessons to the British Army, particularly the first part. But after the Boer War, there was a real effort to identify and implement the lessons. Many of them were uncomfortable, but they directly led to the effectiveness of the British Expeditionary Force that went to war in 1914 and, at the tactical level, punched above its weight. But after the First World War, it was 13 years before the British Army commissioned its Lessons Learned study on the First World War. Once it reported, and it was a very good report, many of the report's uncomfortable lessons were suppressed by the then Army Chief, which didn't help with the British Army's early performance in the first part of World War II. And of course, in peacetime, even if armed forces aren't on operations, they can learn lessons uh, from other countries' wars. Now, a particular case study, and we're all prisoners of our experience, is the British Army I served in from 1975 to 2010. Now, in Northern Ireland, I saw successful adaptation for myself. For example, the Army evolved a very sophisticated approach to intelligence. It established a world lead in public order, in countering IEDs, and it also engaged in what you would fashionably now call embedded partnering with the Royal Ulster Constabulary. In the 1980s, there was an underreported but extensive innovation programme for the Army, masterminded by General Sir Nigel Bagnall. And in his successive positions of Corps Commander, Commander of the British Army in Germany, and Army Chief, um, he set out to change the Army. And this was based in past part of his operational experience in the Second World War in Malaya, 
also on a defence fellowship where he'd studied the Israeli army and on a deep reading of military history and he sought to make the army more effective at manoeuvre warfare. And his initiatives included improving educating and training, including establishing the higher command and staff corps, <coughs> reviving doctrine, re-engaging with the operational level of war, and also commissioning a trial of an air mobile brigade, the second experimental brigade fielded by the British Army in the 20th century. And I'd had the privilege of being in the first year of that trial, which went from no capability at all to brigade conducting four mi missions on a core exercise in a year. Now, working through a small group of trusted subordinates, Bagnall created real momentum, which was, for some years, sustained by the army leadership after he'd gone. And this was combined with the fielding of new equipment, including the Warrior Armoured Vehicle, the Multiple Launch Rocket System, Phoenix, the first ever British UAV, and Bagnall put the army in a really good shape to succeed in two completely unforeseen operations, Desert Storm in 1991 and Bosnia from 1992 onwards. And the British Army in Bosnia itself is an interesting case study in adaptation. In, 19, in the 1980s, the army did very little peacekeeping, stayed, save a relatively static and undemanding operation in Cyprus. But from 1992, it rapidly adapted to the completely unforeseen but much more challenging environment of Bosnia. And it played a leading role in UN and NATO operations, but also quickly developed a new doctrine which was influential and rapidly adopted by many armies. And I saw this myself from a couple of walk-on parts. Now, in all those examples, the successes of innovation and adaptation were greater than the failures to innovate and adapt. And that's the way it should be in an effective military organisation. But I'm afraid that's not the way the British and indeed the US roles in Iraq looks, and to a certain extent Afghanistan. And in Iraq, British strategy came within a wafer's thinness of failure and was redeemed and rescued as much by US and Iraqi efforts as by ours. And the Iraqi inquiry points to suboptimal strategic leadership by politicians, government departments, and indeed by the Ministry of Defence, including senior officers and senior officials. Now, there was much hard fighting and good tactical adaptation and learning by troops in contact. There was, for example, a revolution in battlefield medicine in which the British played a leading role. But I'm afraid I came to the conclusion that for the British in Iraq, for every positive example of adaptation, there were more examples of failures to adapt. And that's not the way it should be. And amongst the middle and senior management of the British Army in 2010, there was a general sense of we could have and should have done better. Now, this has many parallels with the US Army's experience. And in my Adelphi, there's a whole chapter I call on learning under fire that attempts to synthesise the lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, particularly British, American, Canadian, and lessons learned by insurgents. So, what were the key factors that I think made it difficult for the British and the US to adapt to the Iraq war between 2003 and 2009? Firstly, I think the relative success of US and NATO military operations in the 1990s was the result of opponents being less capable, modified and motivated. Now, this created overconfidence, which was reinforced by the attractions of the Revolution in Military Affairs, the RMA, the concept of a modernised network force defeating a less modernised conventional adversary. But the RMA concept, as far as I can tell, was never adequately tested against insurgents. Of course, the initial regime change interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq appeared to confirm the validity of the RMA, but it seems also to have given false confidence to US Defence Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and others, including in London, that Iraq and Afghanistan could be stabilised with minimal forces. So the revolution in military affairs concept misled as much as it informed and contributed to strategic miscalculation. And this was exacerbated by the US and British armies deliberately choosing to neglect to study insurgency and counterinsurgency. Adaptation by um, the US and UK was often too slow. Now, in part, for technological adaptation, this is understandable. My, and my second point is fielding new technologies where there's a new problem posed by the enemy and there is a technological solution that can't be done in a, uh, done in a day. It takes time.
So the short-term uh, adaptation is to alter your tactics, techniques, and procedures. But that, but the technological solution, you know, it'll take time to come online. But um, you know, adaptation by the US and UK was often too slow. A significant factor was that defence bureaucracies, such as the Pentagon and the MOD, wanted to continue with business as usual. Of course, bureaucracies always have inertia, and military hierarchies, with their ingrained tendencies towards standardisation, often dis display the active resistance to change. So forcing military bureaucracies to recognise that business as usual won't meet the imperatives of war, and that they must adapt to the war that they have, rather than the war they want, is a key role of strategic leaders. And it was only when, in the Pentagon, Defence Secretary Robert Gates imposed a sense of urgency on the Pentagon, the US Army and the US Air Force that they were compelled to apply the necessary energy that the wars demanded. And Gates put it like this. And I think what Gates is telling us is that it's essential that organisations are prepared to move outside their comfort zones. And in his excellent chapter of his autobiography called My War with the Pentagon, uh, Gates identifies that some of the reluctance to change that he saw in the Pentagon and that I identified in the British Army and MOD seems to have been caused by an unwillingness of the organisations to make culturally uncomfortable decisions and also an ingrained reluctance to bend themselves out of shape. Candor and dialogue's importance, and at times there was um, a striking level of candor and dialogue within the US Army and US Marine Corps, particularly striking since much of it was in open or relatively open forums. And a British officer who served in Baghdad in the middle of the last decade described the US approach when it worked as one of brutal frankness, you see evidence of a self-critical dialogue reflecting on what was working and what was not, showing a healthy exchange of ideas, not just between tactical practitioners, but also flowing to and from senior officers through company commanders and including enlisted ranks. And some leaders in the US Army and Marine Corps seem confident enough to take critical feedback from their subordinates and to support good ideas with resources and influence. I'm not saying it didn't happen in the British but it was striking at times in the US Army and Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of evidence from organisational studies and from business and from the military that an honest dialogue between the front line, the middle management and the senior leadership can make organisations more agile and effective. And then leadership. This is really the key thing. The successful adaptations made in both wars by international forces and sometimes by... Uh, anti-government forces, show that whilst technology can assist with adaptation, the key enablers and barriers are leadership, culture, and mental and organisational agility. And indeed, what both wars show is that bottom-up adaptations couldn't succeed without the encouragement and engagement and enthusiasm of unit leaders. But bottom-up adaptation by individual military units was most successful when it was complemented by top-down adaptation or direction and support. So, looking at these and various other examples and testing this against non-military examples, these, I think, are the key success factors. And my contention is they apply to innovation and adaptation in the military, and they're supported by the learning of lessons. So... Leading adaptation is a core function of politicians, of civilian officials, of military leaders and commanders, and at all levels. But actually, as people go up the military food chain, energising inherently conservative military command chains and defence bureaucracies becomes more and more essential. There is a degree of inherent tension between discipline and hierarchies that are the essential foundations of armed forces' cohesion and their ability to fight, and some of the requirements of innovation and, and adaptation which can point in the opposite direction. And this includes a willingness to take risks in war, the willingness of subordinates to challenge the received wisdom of their superiors, and the ability to change organisation, equipment and methods under fire. And it's a contest between peacetime bureaucrats and combat entrepreneurs. <coughs> 
Both peacetime innovation and wartime adaptation require common foundations, principally imagination as to the possibilities and potential of change and a willingness to change. And this requires an organisational culture that encourages the upward flow of ideas and perceptions as well as direction from above. And particularly important is the need for senior leaders to encourage their staffs and subordinates to seek out new paths. And there's perhaps also a generational issue in that as well. So the more a military organisation is curious about new possibilities and wants to examine the lessons of recent and contemporary conflicts, the greater the chance that it will successfully innovate and, and, adapt, and adapt. And I think you can discern that some of the military organisations that have shown the ability to innovate and adapt have shown that inherent, uh, inherent curiosity. Um, and technological change poses particular challenges. Now, industry and scientists and technologists will always be offering new and improved weapons or equipment. But the full potential of these can only be realised if the armed forces have coherent concepts into which these new capabilities can be integrated. And a really good example of this is the way that the operational requirement to fight a long-range war over the Pacific against Japan drove into war innovation by the US Navy and Marine Corps. Now, the complexity of new technologies requires senior military leaders to reach out to civilian scientists and experts. And in the Second World War, the British and Americans were really pretty good at this, and they were much, much better than the Germans and Jap Japanese, who self-limited themselves by di displaying an arrogance towards scientists and en en engineers. And, of course, it didn't help the Germans that an awful lot of Jewish scientists and engineers had, 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 had fled the country. So innovation and adaptation also requires a thorough realistic understanding of potential and actual opponents, overconfidence, stereotyping, and racial, cultural, or professional contempt can be fatal. So what's this telling us? It's telling us that the chances of successful innovation and adaptation can be improved by having civilian and military leaderships that embrace imagination and intellectual qualities, can accept advice from their subordinates, uh, learn from their mistakes, and also avoid reinforcing failure. Now, I'm not saying this is easy. And generating military commanders and senior civilian leaders in defence, who are both steadfast and resolute, but can also be agile and flexible enough to innovate in peace, and identify adaptations in war, whilst having the authority and strength of will to drive through the difficult implementation of those changes in peace and war. That's going to be difficult. For example, it requires breaking through organisational silos and working across boundaries, a type of flexible teamwork that's more challenging than leading simple hardwired teams. And all of that needs to be done without damaging existing military effectiveness. Now, reflecting on my military career, which, of course, in, ended six and a half years ago, innovation and adaptation didn't feature at all in the syllabuses of my military education. For example, it was completely absent from the courses of the Army Staff College in 1987, from the UK Joint Higher Command and Staff Course in 2000, from the Royal College of Defence Studies in 2003, and the Defence Leadership Centre course that I attended in the previous decade. And all of that is despite military history being you know, over-endowed with, with exa useful examples. So armed forces that want to improve their innovation and ad adaptation will need to work out how to identify the innovators and adapters in their midst and to, uh, to encourage and energise them. So they need to find ways of tackling, selecting and then promoting innovative and adaptable leaders and I think this might be the most difficult trick of all. Now, I'm conscious that I've probably overemphasised the difficulties, but I want to suggest a couple of things that might help, help with this. And this is the first one, and this is actually taken from arts and culture. Um, it's about constructive criticism by people who have your best interests at heart, but who aren't prepared, you know, who are prepared to give you their honest opinion with no strings attached. And it certainly works in the arts. For example, T.S. Eliot's groundbreaking poem, <coughs> Wasteland. Um, Eliot showed the draft to Ezra, pra Ezra Pound, who basically took out about half of it and rearranged the, the order. 
And you know that's now very well documented because it's all there, and you can find it all on the interweb how this was how this was done. Similarly, Blood on the Tracks, Bob Dylan's probably most successful album ever, um, initially was pretty dull when it was first recorded. It was all in a monotone and didn't sound much different from his early sixties work. And at that stage, the masters were ready to be cut, and CBS Records was getting ready with its marketing campaign. It would come after. At uh, Christmas in 1974, in the week before Christmas, he played it to his brother David, who told him it was too dull. And David actually hired some local musicians at a studio in Minneapolis, and they recut about half the tracks to give them a higher energy, directly contributed to the record's outstanding success. And this is actually something in the great American choreographer Twyla Tharp, um, her autobiography, and the quote from the top is from that. Um, she produced a hugely successful um, dance sort of combination between a musical and a ballet featuring the music of Billy Joel, which played for years on Broadway. But it bombed in Chicago. Uh, but she had a validation, what she called a validation squad, particularly her lighting designer and her son, who gave her that critical, critical feedback. Now, I think there are the odd examples of this from recent, recent military experience. For example, General Petraeus, would assemble an eclectic array of people, not just military, uh, but including think tank people and other experts, uh, all of which seemed to include the then um, Colonel Brigadier H.R. McMaster, into what he called a joint strategic assessment team, which he used in Iraq and when he took over as, as, as CENTCOM. Um, well, after that diversion into culture, um, let's talk about military experimentation. And the value of it, I think, has been proven again and again. But it often seems difficult to get started, let alone to sustain and to integrate its outputs. And this may reflect, of course, the resources, the resources demand, the time and the need for leadership commitment. And it may, of course, reflect inherent resistance to change. Experimentation works. It works in the arts, it works in science, it works in business, and in a sense... It is the basis of the theory of evolution by natural selection, but it often seems difficult in the military. I think there are some principles which are to try new things expecting that some will fail, to make failure survivable, to create a safe space for it, to understand why failures have happened and to exploit success. And I think there's some evidence that in the military, <coughs> small steps, incremental small steps, are often better than giant leaks. And this is what Thomas Ed Edison said on it, which I think does apply to successful military experimentation. Now, you've probably all seen photos of military experimentation of early radar stations, or, for example, the German army ex experimenting in the 1930s with cardboard tanks on bicycles. But I think there are new options that should make experimentation much easier. And they come from two areas. First of all, synthetic environments. I mean, this is a picture taken from um, a, a, a commercial war game, which is also used extensively by the British and NATO military as a training, training vehicle, um, the virtual battle space or the war, various war games produced by Bohemia Inter Interactive. And simulation technology, where much of the R&D has been done by the civilian gaming industry, gives you the ability to try new ideas out in a synthetic environment. And of course, the f widespread fielding of weaponed effect simulators, you see a guardsman on the left um, wearing infantry weapons effect <coughs> simulators on swords of play, and um, the brigade-sized exercises that the US does in the Mojave Desert uh, with everything wired up with weapon effect simulators. They're great for training, fantastic for training, but they also allow exper experimentation. So let's take an example. This is actually taken from uh, one of Bohemia Interactive's games, and it's the work of a community of civilian modders. And they've decided that they'd write some code for some unmanned ground vehicles to be used in the game. But, you know, militaries could use the games, the synthetic environments, to experiment with unmanned ground vehicles. And then once they've worked out which options were worth pursuing, and the simulation had also killed off clear non-starters, they could then strap weapon effect simulators on unmanned ground vehicles and use them on, on exercises like 
um, those that happen regularly on Salisbury Plain or the, the National Training Centre. And these technologies allow quicker and faster experimentation, and they also allow failure to be relatively bloodless. And I think this is potentially an area for industry to work on themselves, but to also help armed forces with to considerable mutual benefit. And, um, you know, an example of uh, uh, experimentation, really good example, where armed forces, scientists and engineers and industry came together was the development of that networked radar-enabled capability by uh, RAF Fighter Command. And crucial to this, of course, was the leadership of Air Marshal Dialding, whose previous appointment had interestingly been the RAF's chief of R&D. So, of course, you're... Um, sorry, and that's my um, sort of summary of my thoughts on experimentation. Now, there's lots of current initiatives. Now, clearly, the US Third Offset and the UK Defence Innovation Initiative ought to be a great opportunity, and they have a degree of high-level leadership, which I have to say is much more conspicuous in the US than the UK, and they're backed by money innovation organisations, in the case of the US, by a chief innovation officer. But I'm afraid both initiatives sometimes appear to me to be in a bit of a historical vacuum, and a bit of denial of the uncomfortable lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, they're both focused on quickly finding game-changing disruptive technologies from outside the military to incrementally add to existing forces. But I think both initiatives, based on what I know in public, and I did go to the launch of the UK Defence Initi uh, Innovation Initiative last autumn, but both initiatives seem to me to underestimate the non-technical challenges, particularly those of making organisation and people more innovative and adaptable. Now, there was an element of that in the public um, speaking about the third offset by um, the previous US Defence Secretary and also by Bob Work, the Assistant Secretary of Defence. I don't hear anything about it in public on um, MOD or Armed Forces discussion of innovation. Mm -hmm. I'd also sound a slightly cautionary note about the formation of bespoke innovation units and innovation officers. Now, I'm not saying they're wrong, but all my analysis suggests that innovation and adaptation must be seen as a mainstream activity for the whole of the organisations, particularly leaders, not just a cell in a remote government office or higher headquarters. I think there are a lot of opportunities for learning, and I'm suggesting there um, some opportunities for the military to learn from other areas. And I think the military does have a lot to learn from business innovation, adaptation, education, and indeed the business consultancy industry. But I think it's got to be frontline orientated rather than sort of back office and logistics, or logistics orientated. And here's some potential areas that I think useful research could be done on. So there we are. I've slightly undershot my 40-minute limit. But actually, um, returning to um, my slide on culture and the arts, what I'd invite you all now is to be critical friends and collectively be my validation squad. Mm -hmm. right. Ben, thank you very much. Um, that kind of presentation is, is the sort of presentation that uh, risks giving IISS a good name. There's got to be a book in there somewhere. Um, there's, there's a, a huge amount uh, in what you've covered, but I'd like to kick off, if I may, by asking you a question. You've emphasised the role of leadership time and again, uh, and rightly so. My experience um, is during um, Iraq and Afghanistan was that perhaps one of the di biggest difficulties we had collectively was in the failure of our political leaders to call things by their name. You know, there was such a desire to uh, assure the British public that no small animals were harmed in the conduct of these uh, military operations mm -hmm. that uh, my own experience you know, was um, that, that, that uh, uh, when, when demanding my organisation to operate to a wartime tempo, not only did I get a certain amount of institutional drag, but active pushback by people saying to me, how dare you say we're at war? That's a horrible thing to say we're not. And whilst, as you can imagine, I, I, I was not 
you know, overly sympathetic to that uh, approach. Given the message coming from the top political leadership, it's not entirely um, surprising. You know, uh, can we actually do this if the top political leaders uh, are prepared to take ownership of this? Well, it wasn't just the UK and the US who had this problem. I mean, it, it was a real problem with Germany, um, who had really some quite uncomfortable mm -hmm. encounters with the sharp end of war in um, Afghanistan, particularly mm -hmm. as the campaign heated up. Um, and I wouldn't be, you know, if there were a German army officer here with Afghanistan experience, he might have well have posed the, the same question. Mm. Um, Nigel, that's always going to be a factor. But what I detected in the UK Ministry of Defence and what Robert Gates diagnosed in the Pentagon was an unwillingness of senior leadership to put the medium and long term future at risk by making uncomfortable decisions about the yeah. now and the short term. And the British example is um, that there, were, there was reluctance in the higher management of defence and the way the money and the programme was being allocated to take money out of prestigious service mm. programmes in all three environments. Uh, and bandwidth and, inter and, and staff effort at the expense of, um, you know, get sorting out Iraq mm -hmm. and Afghanistan. Um, you know, that's certainly... It, uh, the Iraq inquiry isn't perfect, but mm -hmm. I would commend to you the work it did on protection from IEDs mm -hmm. that I think pretty comprehensively shows that the senior leadership of the army was slow to wake up to the urgency mm -hmm that the urgency was then actually injected by Lord Drayson, um, who, if there was a ministerial man of the match award for the MOD during the Iraq and Afghanistan war, I'd probably give it to him. And he injected political urgency, which, if you like, put the army on notice that it had to come to, you know, make short-term improvements pretty damn quickly. And I'd also commend to you, um, you know, Gates's autobiography, because he saw the same behaviour with the US army being unwilling to put at risk its future armoured vehicle program, mm. and enormous reluctance in the US Air Force to build the unmanned aircraft mm. capability as quickly as was demand demanded, uh, and uh, you know a defensive crouch to not put at risk, for example, mm. the F twenty two program, which wasn't going to be re very relevant to winning in Iraq and uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you know and. Uh, I think I return to my previous comments on leadership, but even within different political leadership, you know, this is a core function of military leadership and that of civilian officials in defence mm. as well. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll uh, you know, take questions now. Could I ask you please to uh, tell, tell us who you are? Um, gentleman in the front row. It's Masato Kibura, a Japanese journalist. I would like to have an ongoing risk on a Manchester bomb. And we saw the uh, pictures of remains of explosive device uh, <coughs> on New York Times. Uh, so I would like to ask to them, uh, how do you evaluate <coughs> supply chain of IED bomb in Europe? And secondly, uh, how do you see to Niger and the US why they leak uh, such kind of very important images? Can, can I suggest that we take those, you know, sort of um, um, out of committee, so to speak, since they're not really, you know, directly involved? We'll answer your questions, but perhaps not in uh, um, not in plenary session. Yeah, I'm, I'm Nigel and I both have things we can add. One of the things that surprised the, the Brits and the US early in the Iraq War was how rapidly sheer militants acquired advanced IED technology. And they, the expression being banded around in the British Army by the end of 2004 is they've learned in you know, a year what it took the IRA 25 years mm. to learn. Well, perhaps people shouldn't have been so surprised about it because they were mentored by Lebanese Hezbollah, who had a credible track record in this. But furthermore, the internet enabled the learning and the, sp and the spreading of um, exper exper experience and what they mm. saw as, as good practice. Um, the whole IED, counter IED story from Iraq and Afghanistan is a, um, a very good example of, of 
successes and failures and the limitations of adaptation. And for those of you who are interested in it, I commend to you an essay in the Military Balance about 2012 and also an ISS strategic comment that, that sets that out. But I, th I think it's um, you know, a really good example that brings this to life. Thanks. Yeah, there was a particular problem with uh, so-called explosively formed projectiles, uh, and, and this was a technology that was uh, disseminated in that way. I mean, you can't learn to build these bombs off the internet, so to speak, but what you can do is get the ideas and the uh, techniques that you can then actually start to, you know, to practice. Anyway, so, sir. So, I'm a, I'm a consultant with Deloitte, and to be honest with you, the stories that you tell about the military are actually almost identical to the stories that you in, in business. So, I think mm. it's fair to say that mm. um, this, the challenges that you describe are pretty consistent in any large organizations mm. that have complex technical issues. One thing is emerging, I just wanted to share this with you. There's a very interesting book called um, Innovation, in, Innovation Incorporated. It's written by the, the founder of Pixar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book that basically says, how do you build organizations that continuously innovate? Mm -hmm. And so the basic premise is that no organization is going to work if it's static. I wonder if, if that's what you're really pointing to, this idea that, that an organization in which it has to live in such a dynamic environment as the military does, really has to move away from anything that's static and just, just continuously innovate all the time. Are you going as far as that? Um, bizarrely, I got a good acquaintance with this at an art gallery in New York last year who, who had a major exhibition telling the Pixar story, and that came out in spades. The difference between the military and Pixar is that DreamWorks are not trying to kill members of Pixar. <laughs> they're, trying to do, they're, they're trying to dominate the multiplex. Yeah. Uh, and although there is um, both personal income and reputation and everything at risk. You know, it is a, a different order of risk. Um, the thing about, about warfare in general is it's an outdoor sport, it's a dangerous sport, it's a young man and increasingly young woman's sport, and your opponents have a vote and are out there to defeat you, not just win the game, but to, to defeat you. And I think the evidence is that, that down at the lower tactical level, hardwired organisations like a warship's company or an air force squadron or indeed an, an, an army battalion, which have changed and evolved, you know, even over the time I was in the military, they're pretty useful vehicles for sustaining people's morale, for focusing leadership, and also as that keynote in getting things done. Now, at times, people have ad adapted them. Um, a good example from Iraq, from the British, is the way that uh, the armoured brigade that was in Iraq in 2008 suddenly rearranged half the brigade into operational men mentoring and liaison teams for the Iraq army at very short, short notice. Um, and I think increasingly, um, successful military organisations... Um, have to be capable of working in a very networked way. And I've, I've seen this myself in several areas, and it's something that usually special forces are pretty good at, but I've also seen a lot of it in air forces as well. Um, it's that bit above it. You know, so, so in, if, if you like, in the supermarket industry, you know, supermarkets are units that are roughly in, anag analogous to companies or bat battalions. But the organisation between the supermarket and head office has been through quite a, quite a change in the last 20 years. You know, if you wanted a revolutionary example, it was the development of the, the Tesco card, mm. which effectively also became a way of gathering data in a very intelligent surveillance and reconnaissance way, which revolutionised the way Tesco decided what to put on the, put on the shelves. Um, I hope that helps. But I think you make a very, very good point. A gentleman in the third row there. I'm John Kisley, I'm a former soldier. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're absolutely right there to put your finger on leadership and culture. Um, I think in the business world, um, best practice would be seen to be appointing a champion for innovation and change. Mm. In a strictly hierarchical organisation like Armed Forces, that champion's probably got to be the top man or woman. Mm -hmm. 
both top man and a woman in uniform, mm. but also politically. And unless you achieve that in one of the two, either the, the politician or the senior military guy mm. who is prepared to champion innovation and change, it ain't going to happen. Mm. Because as soon as that person starts showing that, you know, this is career enhancing mm. move if you're into innovation and adaptation, suddenly a lot of people find it very interesting subject and all for innovation and change. And I'd say the biggest obstacle to that is probably within the British military inter-service rivalry in that almost anything that gets discussed in the military defence by people in different uniforms is on the basis of how that will give advantage, budgetary advantage, to their own service. Yeah. However much they claim this is all a thing of the past, and nowadays we, we think in a very different way, it ain't the case. So to me, leadership culture, absolutely key. Is that Th thanks for that. Um, th there's a number of people who represent the middle management, of the, certainly the British Army here. Um, can I offer two two sort of observations. The, the first one is, I was privileged at times to serve in brigades where there was a sort of shared sense of purpose, where actually, certainly amongst the, you know, the officer corps and, for example, the warrant officers, there was a real feeling that actually if we could find a better way of doing this or something that was more effective, um, we'd do it. And, and the leadership was able to back that up. Now, it might not surprise you that that, that was three brigades included three brigades in Northern Ireland. And in the, certainly the early part of the British campaign in Northern Ireland, there were some real examples of good ideas right down at the tactical level that were backed by leadership at brigade and divisional level and rapidly spread through the force. Uh, the um, identification of a technique known as search analysis um, was, was one of those. Um, Similarly, the, the Air Mobile Brigade I was in for the year's trial, you know, there was a real sort of unity of purpose there and trying out of new ideas and backing the winning ones. I think on the, the inter-service bit, I mean, I, I was, I'm not so old that I had a predominantly single-service education, although I was privileged to serve on an early iteration of the joint higher command and staff course. And I do sense that the senior leadership of the British military is a bit more joint because they've been through a what is inherently a joint mm. staff course and all the key as an advanced staff course and all the key leaders have also been on the joint higher command staff course I don't think you're ever going to eradicate that although I, I'd note in the British case that one of the purposes of their joint forces command which is a relatively recent innovation seems to be to provide that essential lubrication to bring the three services together in a less in a way that reduces the friction. Right, yes, right at the back there. Sorry. Uh, Martin Toll from the uh, British Army's uh, Chaser. Um, I, I think as a sort of matter of reassurance, the, um, the senior leadership of the British Army certainly is fully responding to the um, requirement to innovate in peacetime and to be ready to then adapt in war. Uh, so, and that is a consistent theme of CGS's current narrative. I, I would say I think it is, it is hitting the stops of resources and time because in order to be able to experiment, you need to be out with uh, force preparation for core outputs. You need mm. to be able to dedicate resources uh, of which both time and finances are, are obviously short. And that creates a pressure on both commodities, and I think it also creates further um, pressure in terms of the culture that uh, still is hugely intolerant of failure. And you mentioned creating space to fail. Uh, have you seen any examples of military organisations that have uh, embraced a culture in which uh, ability to fail has been accepted and actually regarded as a virtuous necessity en route to finding success? Um, I've seen some of it um, in UK and US Special Forces. I've seen some of it in those um, examples from the British Army, Martin. 
um, although no case w was the trying out of a new, did the trying out of a new idea result in the deaths of some soldiers, um, which of course would have you know, posed an interesting challenge. Um, I think there's some evidence that at times you've se this has been seen in the Israeli armed forces. Uh, indeed, I'm sure um, it is still obtainable, but I actually read Bagnall's um, dissertation he did on the Israeli armed forces, which was called the Israeli armed forces, a study of quality. And what Bagnall sought to do with this dissertation was to try and explain why in the late 1940s, in 1956, uh, 67 and 73, the Israeli armed forces numerically smaller, and in those days, not necessarily with a technological advantage, had comprehensively trounced their opponents at a tactical level every, every, every time. And I have a, have a sense that that was one of the big influences in the change programme that Bagnall ran for the British Armed Forces. Um, if I can give you an example of this, I was lucky enough uh, five years ago to spend an afternoon at the Israeli National Training Centre in the Negev Desert, um, which is, if you, you know, if you ever get the opportunity to go, it's well worth going. And they had a similar setup to the US National Training Centre, or what the Brits do in sort of planning Canada in terms of force and force exercises. And this was orientated at bringing a whole brigade through, a brigade with two or three major units, and it doing uh, a minimum of two weeks, reserve brigades, longer for regular brigades. And on the force on force training with the weapon effect simulators, what was explained to us was in the first week, ten days, the battle groups would go through various exercises to bring them up to a, you know, a high standard of tactical training. But then, provided that the battle groups had achieved the minimum standard, if they possibly could, the final exercise would be free play. So they'd split the brigade in half and have half of it fight the other half under control of the brigade headquarters. Because they felt that they were very clear, they felt that was the best learning experience of all. Hmm. Uh, yes, sir. I'm James Gaynor on HQ Concepts. Gaynor, I wonder if you would accept in any way a thesis that, that would say that part of the reason for the military and maybe the army's slowness to adapt to Iraq and Afghanistan wasn't just down to kind of bloody minded intransigence on behalf of <coughs> the senior leadership, but also perhaps in some way reflected in the institutional um, instinctive reluctance to, to bend yourself um, rapidly out of shape in order to deal with the exigencies of uh, a war of choice versus one of national survival. And then, in fact, in some ways, those very fears are, are now coming home to roost, as, as a result, arguably, of Operation Entirety and facing, to use the natural of the day, mm. the army on a campaign footing. We now find ourselves facing perhaps a 10-year lag before we're mm. actually reconfigured to face arguably the biggest threat that now emerges back in Europe today. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> just to supplement that, yeah. um, I think a key test for armed forces faced with that sort of dilemma is there will probably be some capabilities that, that are required which haven't been fashionable in peacetime. And what we saw with Iraq and Afghanistan was capabilities like civil military cooperation, um, like capacity building other armed forces and security, security forces, and linguists and latterly cultural ana analysis. And the US, the UK and some of their allies really struggled to grow these capabilities quickly enough once they'd realised how useful it was going to be. Both armies were quite lucky that they had a lot of reserves to, tr to, to draw on. Um, But, you know, it looked to me when I did the work on the British Army in Iraq that there could have been more effort and energy put into that. Now, within the British Army and many other armies, there are the tribes, the branches, what the British call the arms and services. And by and large, if you've got a capability that's powerfully sponsored by a branch itself that's influential within the organisation, it'll get the justice and the effort it deserves. If it falls between the crack or is sponsored by a less influential branch, it's going to be more, more difficult. Um, you know, so you need someone in the organisation, including the top leader, to a certain extent has to be patron saint of unpopular causes. Now, 
another part of my job in the Institute is looking as independently and dispassionately as I can at the capability of the UK Armed Forces. And if I can just take a positive note, when you look at the two reorganisations of the British Army, the 2010 one and the 2015 one, what you see from an outsider's point of view is a real effort in terms of organisation to institutionalise the very hard lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan. And there's really some quite innovative stuff there. The Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Brigade, 77 Brigade, uh, the Engineer Brigade itself, which, for example, has a search and EOD group that includes all the Army's search and EOD capabilities and its formed regiment of military dogs. Um, I also see that with the Royal Air Force. You know, you see in the organisation equipment of the Royal Air Force, an Air Force that's learned the hard way about the need to be balanced between the air equivalent of combat, combat support and combat service support. You know, it's an Air Force which is often criticised for not having as many fast jets as it might do, but actually it's, it's compared with other Air Forces, really well resourced in airborne I-Star, in drones, in strategic lift, in air-to-air -air refueling and Air Force C2. What I sometimes wonder about the British Armed Forces is whether the Royal Navy, although it's been on operations, hasn't been on quite you know, the learning under fire over the last 15 years that the other two services had. Um, whether the Royal Navy has had to go through that rapid forced evolution. But I, I, do, I, I do think, you know, my colleagues in the Defence and Military Analysis Programme share this view, that actually there's, there's quite a lot of evidence of the Army and Air Force having institutionalised those hard lessons which are relevant to the future. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yes. There and then at the back. Yes. Ben, um, you're touching there on the, uh, on something you brought up in harsh lessons. Your book, harsh lessons, is hmm. the integration between the armed forces um, and other armed forces worldwide, and also um, with a, with a variety of different agencies in order to. Uh, I don't mean the intelligence agencies, it's more the concept of, of institutions in order to be able to provide a much more joined up um, uh, 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 capability. But that, that's on the positive side, the, side, the, the adaptability. Um, turn things around another way. How about looking at um, some of the opposition um, which we face? It's sort of the adaptability of um, uh, ISIS, I should never want to call them. Um, the ability to um, go beyond just the military to bring in, um, in religion, um, internet. It's, it's, a, it's a much, much broader picture they're facing, um, and it's a much bigger um, picture they're imagining. The same, and the same thing for major um, opponents like China um, and Russia is they've got, well, we were listening a few weeks ago to, about uh, China and and low state oppression inside there, which is a, it's a very good way of helping the, their forces. We look at China's um, cyber capability. We look at, at similar things in a different way in Russia. It's, it's, a, it's a bigger picture, I perceive, than just the military. Yes. I mean, I, I agree with you. And I think what you said, China's with a lot of um, thought of our other experts in the Institute. Um, <coughs> You could say that, 20, I'll grossly oversimplify, 20th century warfare, at the end of the First World War, the British and the French had laid the foundations for combined armed land combat and also uh, of the 20th century and of the 21st century, and they've also uh, done quite a lot of work on integrating air power into, into it. Uh, the Second World War, there's not so much new um, airborne forces what is new, perhaps, is, is the fantastic integration of intelligence that the Americans and mm. British did, and the, the flourishing of the full spectrum of air power, including mm. things like air manoeuvre. Um, what I think Iraq and Afghanistan tell us is it's not just combined arms and joint. It has to be combined arms and interagency, inter what's called the comprehensive method, um, or the British are increasingly calling the in integrated approach. And, you know, it looks to, to us like the Russians and Chinese have learned the lesson. You know, China's um, activity in the South China Sea seems to be whole of government from the outset. Um, you could argue that what happened in Crimea and the way the rebellion was raised in eastern Ukraine was an example of the comprehensive approach turned to the dark side. Uh, the other th final thing is, I think what... Uh, 
China's approach to the internet, which mm. Nigel Inkster is, you know, is a considerable expert on and has himself written an excellent Delphi book on. You know, what that shows is technology is neutral mm. and that liberal democracies aren't necessarily the only beneficiaries from this range of new technologies. Mm. You know, for example, if I was running a repressive regime, I'd be very interested in exploiting analysis of social media to help me retain mm. my regime control. At risk of a bit of product placement, we are working um, now actively to try and develop a program on military use of cyber capabilities. Um, and you know, I, I'm starting the, you know, this, this off with an argument that instead of trying to construct some uh, overarching conceptual uh, approach based on what we think the internet is, we need to start by um, looking uh, very specifically at what key actors are actually doing and what they think it is, and then try to extrapolate some generalities from that. So watch this space. Uh, um, yes, sir. Hi, I'm um, Henry William, MOD serving soldier, but I'm currently seconded for, to Google for a year. You asked for You're a, wearing Google uniform. You asked, uh, yeah, we're all wearing a uniform that's 200 years old. And yeah. it's changed. Um, you uh, asked for a critical friend, and I thought I'd just offer up two things and grateful for your thoughts on it. The first one was just the comments on Pixar, and being well aware of the sort of lethal risks, I just think as soldiers we should urge caution and, and a bit of humility and still ask ourselves what might we learn from these companies. By way of example, they're particularly good at sort of upward feedback or 360 reports, and it just struck me when I was working at Google, and they said, what's your motto? And I said, serve to lead, and they said, how do you measure that? The people <laughs> that you're serving, mm. and it was like, oh no, it's just from above. Mm. And it talks to your point of leadership, and how mm. do you get rid of those bottlenecks of people that don't want to change? So that's one. And then the second one i just offer up was the, the comment, and I completely agree with you about needing to change the organization um, writ large and develop an, uh, innovative culture but there's a lot of evidence to show that actually you need to set up you know, the skunk works model just as Lockheed did in the second world war or Amazon have done with lab 129 and Google have done with Google X because if you try and drive innovation from within the antibodies are so strong that they'll just kill it and therefore you take your sort of um, dynamo outside and bleed the change back in just grateful for your thoughts on those two points um, having experienced 360 degrees feedback on a couple of occasions in my military career, both of which were linked to training and education rather than my uh, actual employment, um, I think it's a very, very useful tool. Uh, what I would say is that and various species of personality profiling and establishing team dynamics, you really need credible experts. Um, but not credible ex experts who've gone half the way down to being snake charmers. Mm. But I certainly think it's got an extremely useful rule, and I think it's certainly a very humbling experience. I mean, I think, uh, maybe I should have emphasised this, but I think humility is, is a lesson that comes out, out, of, out of all of this. And time and again, when you do that Second World War comparisons between the UK and the British and the Germans and Japanese. And for example, in the intelligence area, this is, that's brilliantly portrayed in Max Hastings' book, The Secret War. You, know, you couldn't go for a better single-volume case study. You know, senior British people were humble enough to bring in scientists and experts who didn't necessarily wear the conventional uniform and um, could, could, could portray uncomfortable, uncomfortable news. Skunk works, you know, there's no doubt skunk, skunk works work. I mean, you know, Stealth Fighter was a product of that. Um, and indeed, black program, black programs work, you know, although people would say black programs, you know, are the, are the dollars and the pounds being spent as efficiently and effectively and accountably as, as they should be. Um, I think you could achieve skunk works like effects now without having to necessarily set up a skunk works, but to have a lot of people who were trying out new ideas in synthetic environments and then trying them out in synthetic environments with, um, with real soldiers. Um, and I think that would also help you 
address the other lines of development from the equipment lines of development. I think, though, um, you have to be very careful with skunk works and black programs and secret programs, and I'm, I do wonder if this applies to military cyber, because the danger is it can produce secret weapons that are so secret and they're never used. Hmm. Do any, have any of you ever heard of the Canal Defence Light? It's not surprising. A full brigade of night fighting tanks was developed by the British in the Second World War, and it was available to fight in Northwest Europe, but it was so secret, nobody knew about it, and it wasn't employed. And I think what we see with the US military and cyber, with the Army and the Marine Corps, and I suspect in the other two services as well, is they've said quite clearly a lot of this cyber capability depends on the very secret black capabilities of the National Security Agency. But we've got to have cyber teams that can actually deploy to brigade combat teams or indeed expeditionary air wings or naval task forces. And they've got to be the gearing. And I think as you bring in new capabilities, you've got to look very closely at making uh, the gearing work. Um, I think we've come to our culminating point. So I'll just tell you a sort of, I'll just tell you one anecdote about what you might get from a sort of skunk worksy type thing that was playing around in synthetic environments. And this is an anecdote I call Flying Dinosaurs Over Hellman Province. I saw this for myself. In the early 80s, the Army and British Special Forces experimented with microlight aircraft. There are a number of hobbyists in the armed forces, and they thought, well, this would be really useful in northwest Europe because it could be a sort of dispatch rider motorbike of the air. And, you know, this must have some interesting special forces applications. So hundreds of thousands of pounds were spent purchasing microlites, and various members of the Army Microlighting Club went and took part in the trial. And at the end of it, not only had quite a few microlites been broken, as had been a number of bones, but the conclusion were, was that in northwest Europe, the climate was against it. Because actually, the number of days in which you could successfully use a microlite in a military role was so few, because of wind and rain and cloud, it wasn't worth pursuing them. Come 2009, the British armies or British land forces are in quite some difficulty in Helmand. This is before the US Marines have come in. You know, the force ratio isn't adequate, not enough tracks, not enough helicopters. So, funny old thing, the microlight enthusiasts start saying, we ought to use microlights in Helmand. You know, they could be the dispatch rider, they could also fulfill the functions of drones, they could carry urgently needed spare parts. Why aren't we using microlights in Helmand? And by the way, chaps, the weather in Helmand would allow microlights to be used most of the time. So this went to the Land Warfare Centre, who had a scientific advice section. And they decided they'd tre test this in a virtual environment. So they had the virtual battle space system, in which they got a detailed digital terrain base of Hellman. They can simulate all British forces and all British and Allied weapons and all aircraft and Taliban stuff. Um, but of course, they didn't have any microlight aircraft. But one of the um, scientists who ran this was a, you know, had slight geeky tendencies. And he knew that there were civilian modders for the civilian game that used the same software who'd written mod to allow people to go big game hunting. So you could go and hunt elephants and rhino. And someone had then taken that and written the code for prehistoric wildlife, including the great flying reptiles of the Cretaceous era. And some of these flying reptiles were about the size of a microlight in quite a similar shape. <laughs> and they flew at about the same speed. Mm. So all this chap had to do was take that, re-skin it so it looked like a microlight. And then in one room, he had someone flying the microlight on typical missions. In the other room, he had four soldiers from the local infantry battalion representing a Taliban squad. And what was established within one working day is the microlight would fly so low and slow mm. that it would be easily detect yeah. detected and very, very easy to shoot down. So what the uh, virtual environment had done was examine what had been a perfectly credible idea mm. and shown actually it probably wasn't worth pursuing. I mean, as a, an example, you know, there's a lot of indicators that unmanned vehicle technology could revolutionise some aspects of land warfare, including armoured fighting vehicles and it could be that in you know people could have tank platoons where say there were two manned tanks and two unmanned tanks and you could then go further and design the man out of the tank and come up with a smaller cheaper lighter remote, remotely operated tank 
well, that's the sort of thing that can be tried out in a synthetic environment now. And then having established what, work, what, what, what would work and what might not work, then you could mock up on a few SUVs some unmanned tanks and knock them around Salisbury Plain or the National Training Centre. So, you know, I think if you took some of the great military innovators of the past, like, for example, the people who masterminded the German experiments with armoured warfare in the 1920s and 1930s, and you showed them this technology, they'd say, why aren't you making more use of it? Hmm. I think that's about it, really. Yeah, thank you. There's one last question, then. I think you know, experience shows uh, suggests that we've probably got about two and a half days of the British summer left, and we might want to have a bit of time to enjoy it. But uh, uh, take one last question first. Just a quick question, Walter, and the army officer. I'd be grateful for your comments and thinking on the relationship between defensive views and adaptations, particularly since it has been placed on a regular cycle and also given previous comments about. Uh, Having to do more with less can force innovations mm. that might not otherwise happen. The danger is that a military organisation that's having to do with more, that's having resources taken away from mm. it on a continuous basis can become over-defensive and go into that sort of defensive crouch, which is, I think, why, actually, you know, leaders who are prepared to um, lead innovation, even in those difficult times, are um, very, very important. Um, in the literature on this, you know, there isn't enough literature, and some of it is over-complicated. I think people sometimes debate... Have you got to bring in an outsider to these very conservative military organisations to make this work? The evidence I've seen is an outsider can act as a really important stimulus. You know, Winston Churchill was, because it was he who forced Bomber Command to face the uncomfortable fact that it was missing the target in 1941. You know, Lord Drayson's another example from my, my time. But actually, to make the change work, you know, you've got to energise insi insiders. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in danger here of, of, of sounding unsympathetic, but I think you know, defence reviews that reduce resources make innovation more important. Um, but also, I think you know, what armed forces do need to do is they need to do sort of horizon scanning. You know, they need to be looking at technological opportunities or ways they might do things differently, or indeed things that other nations' armed forces, mm. and even irregular forces, you know, terrorists and, and insurgents and criminals, you know. And they need to be ready when the situation changes or the opportunity presents itself um, to move rapidly into new, new directions. So that requires experts to genuinely be experts. You know, say, for example, the small arms experts within the British Army do need to be horizon scanning what's going on in small arms globally. Um, and I think it, what it also reinforces is this business of learning lessons, not just in operations, but learning lessons in peacetime from other things that are going on, and sort of having an institutional brain somewhere that's saying, well, these are the ones that are directly relevant that we must mainstream. These are the ones that might be relevant, which we can't afford to ignore, so at least we need an ability to generate this capability or regenerate this capability. And for example, armies have often put that capability in the reserve, or mainly in the reserve. And then those that we just maintain a watch on. Good. Ben, thank you very much. That's, that, that was an absolutely masterly uh, presentation. Um, and um, you know, I, I think, you know, I really do hope that uh, uh, there is a book in there because I think it could uh, be a really stunning contribution to the intellectual output of this uh, institute. Um, thank you very much indeed. Would you please join me in thanking Ben for his presentation?